This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast. Our transmasculine gender query. Where we discuss our journey through gender expression, transmasculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. This is about way more than bullies in our schools. This is about our school boards, our homes, and our country. This is about every small town, every suburb, and every city. This is about how people talk about us and treat us. This is about how we talk about ourselves and treat ourselves. This is not just about how it gets better when you get older. Do you want me to wait till later? Hell no! This is not just about being picked on for being different. It's about being queer. This is about how people assume that I'm a girl. People ask me if I have a girlfriend. People assume that I'm a boy. I am so over that. I'm so over that. I'm pretty much over that. <laughs> like the whole, when did you come out? As if it were one time. In the locker room, in the bathroom. On the first day of school. And the second, and the third. To my English teacher, to my math teacher, to my science teacher. At my last job interview. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. We can shift the conversation about gender and sexuality. This is reteaching gender and sexuality. Because we all have a gender and a sexuality. The very concept of coming out is an old, sad idea. That normal is being straight. And everything else is just LGBT. T Q Q I A A. This is how my identities cannot be summed up in letters. Together, we're taking a deeper look at what's happening in our communities. This is how queer youth like me wind up homeless. And dropping out of school. And getting harassed by the police. This is how queer youth like me end up in jail. This is not just about same-sex marriage or military service. This is about a culture of don't ask, don't tell in my school. This is about not having supportive adults in my life up until now. And this is about needing more than just a safe space. How about liberating space? This is about being happy. This is about having a personal connection. I'm not interested in my community, just surviving. I want us to be thriving. I want my life to be awesome now. This is about young people being educators and advocates for themselves. This is about the power of a young queer person meeting another queer person. Like me. Or like me. Or like, like us. us. This is about people letting go of old ideas. I am a boy and a girl. I can like boys and girls. And I can be none of the above. This is reteaching gender and sexuality. And not only to the bullies, or the newspapers, or the president, but to our superintendents and teachers, people that write our health books, and our history books, our social workers and doctors, our police departments, our churches, to our friends, to our family, and to our legislators. Join us to put this on the map. Welcome to GenderCast episode 5 and we are very excited to have Sid and Kennedy here with us today for an interview about Put This on the Map which is a film that they recently produced and directed and to talk to us about their reteaching gender and sexuality campaign. So welcome Sid and Kennedy. Thanks Jesse and Sean. We're really excited to be here. So why don't we just start out with you telling us a little bit about what Put This on the Map is. So actually, Put This on the Map started as a uh, documentary film project that Kennedy and I conceived of while working in East King County, which is the eastern suburbs of Seattle. And we were working with several young people there who identified as queer or trans. And we wanted to create a film that would explicitly allow them to tell their stories about growing up in the suburbs and tell a story that is often sort of swept under the rug in suburban communities. So that's how it started and actually our group began to do education work using that documentary tool and late last year, November 2010, uh, with a bunch of queer youth activists that we work with on this education work, we launched the campaign Reteaching Gender and Sexuality and that campaign is a national campaign that comes out of the local work that we've been doing on this topic. So Kennedy, why don't you tell us about what drew you to hooking up with Sid and doing Put This on the Map? So back in 2008, when we started the project Put This on the Map, I was working in a teen center in East King County called the Kirkland Teen Union Building as a licensed mental health counselor. I was a visible queer person in the community who was working with young people. And so as a result, one thing that happened was my office became kind of a revolving door of queer youth coming to seek counseling services that at the time were free and confidential at that center through a nonprofit agency called Youth Eastside Services. I was holding a lot of stories about queer youth in this area and realized that there was a story to be told 
um, not only to me, but to all their service providers and to all their teachers in the area. So Put This on the Map really started as like a local training tool that Sid and I were inspired to create as Sid was directing the Teen Center at that time and also in relationship with a lot of these queer youth through the recreation and arts program that she was cultivating over there. So we applied for some funding and got it, and we were able to create this 34-minute documentary alongside the queer youth as a project that not only engaged them to create the video, but then also to continue working with them as educators on their own lives and issues that they were dealing with. I saw the film for the first time at a Department of Social and Health Services saying it out loud conference and was just really impressed with both the film and your facilitation the workshop that you did after yeah we always saw the film as sort of a pedagogical tool and we think that actually the accompanying educational curriculum is pretty critical to how one can watch and interpret the film and sort of be guided through some of the common themes and we chose not to do that within the film context but instead let the narratives really stand alone so that we can continue to tailor to different audiences how they might watch it. Just seeing the film, you don't get the whole experience. I love how you put gender on the continuum and you had us all stand in the room, part of the workshop that comes after. So for those of you that are listening, if you get to see the film, try to do the workshop too. So the next question really is, um, how did you guys meet? Sid and I are actually both from East King County. Uh, We grew up there as young people. Sid's from an area called Bothell, which is in unincorporated King County, and I'm from Bellevue, which is one of the primary suburbs over there in East King County. And we both grew up there and didn't know each other necessarily in high school, but then were brought into youth services early on as teenagers ourselves, working with young people, doing peer-to-peer work, and then also work in art and cultural centers and teen centers and camping services. And so through that, we found ourselves working together at the same teen center in our early 20s, throwing shows such as the infamous anti-beauty pageant, which brought together like really awesome musicians from the time. It was kind of some of the first organizing work that we did together. From there, we continued to both work in youth services. And in 2006, we conspired to both work at the Kirkland Teen Union Building. So Sid was a director and I became the therapist on staff on site. And we have been working together on Put This on the Map. And then now the Reteaching Gender and Sexuality campaign ever since. And we're also just good friends. Tell us a little bit more about this anti-beauty pageant. That sounds really interesting. You know, I grew up listening to a lot of local music. And at the time, a lot of local music was happening at teen centers, actually, for all ages, communities. Like, I grew up in the late 90s to sort of contextualize sort of the tail end of the Riot Girl movement that was happening here in Seattle. And I listened to a lot of bands that had strong, like, female leads and was really excited by sort of cultivating more community around that and offering young people, young women in particular, the opportunity to sort of see themselves reflected in other musicians and other artists in the DIY community. So the anti-beauty pageant was in large part sort of inspired by Lady Fest, Yo-Yo Go-Go, other DIY festivals happening around that time in the mid to late 90s. And it was held in Bellevue, which again is a suburb that we've been working on with Put This on the Map, um, at a time when, you know, there was like nothing like that happening in the suburbs. And we had it three years in a row. I think the year that Kennedy and I met working on it, 2002, there were like 400 people that showed up to this tiny little house that could hold like 80. And, um, you know, a whole weekend happened and, you know, the gossip was there and you know, Brandy Carlisle and these people who now have pretty big followings were all there in this house rocking out and teaching other young people how to make music and create community. I don't think some people even know that Brandy's from here anymore. She's gotten so big. But she's awesome. Yeah. It's so interesting, too, because, like, when I think of the East Side and Bellevue, you always think of the, you know, the more affluent, more privileged side of town, and it's like, oh, no that's over there and to see the the actual documentary be focused on the kids and it it, I think it challenges a lot of stereotypes that local people have about the east side of King County as well right so when we created put this on the map Sid and I had a hypothesis around the story of queer youth living over there that there's something different about growing up as a queer youth in the suburbs in America and for me that was very much true growing up in Bellevue I didn't hear about queer people I didn't know many queer people There was just a real lack of visibility and a real lack of learning about queer people or knowing about them in my experience. So when we created Put This on the Map, part of the reason we even named the film such is because we wanted to 
bring to everyone's attention that, yeah, queer youth live in suburbs like Bellevue uh, and grow up there. And they live in every town and every community across our country and everywhere. And so that was very much part of why we created the film and why we named it Put This on the Map and has to do with some of the questions we ask the young people throughout the film about their particular experiences growing up in that area and the subtle forms of oppression that they experience at their schools and in their homes and in their communities. And that really takes a form of silencing I and mean, not really hearing about other people with lives like theirs. I think um, maybe some of the other myths that are illuminated also in the movie are around race and class, too, because I think that when we talk about myths, it's just like generalization. So this is a community that is very affluent. I mean, Bill Gates lives in this area, actually. I think more billionaires live in this area than anywhere else in the country. And at the same time, you do have low-income communities. You have uh, immigrant communities. And those communities are really also dismissed within the myth, too. So part of Put This on the Map was showing young people from all different backgrounds who also identify as queer and are also creating community with each other over there and showing that as part of sort of the beautiful story that's happening. Now that you guys have been on tour for a little while and have taken this out on the road with varying communities, have you seen some of the same generalizations present or has there been differences from community to community that you've noticed? You know, when we first showed the movie, we had a couple of people come up and say, why don't you take off that part about this being about Bellevue and Kirkland and stuff? Because that's not really important because what's happening here is um, you kind of don't need that or something. And Kennedy and I, for a minute, were like, oh. And then we remembered the value that we started with and how powerful I think that that value is, which is that we really didn't set out to try to cover a queer youth experience or an LGBT youth experience. We didn't want to endeavor such a thing. We wanted to make a film that was about this specific community, and we wanted to use that in the community. And what's been beautiful about the film is seeing other people draw out the universal themes and be able to talk about how it might relate to their community without it being sort of put upon them that that was their community. That's been like really amazing to see. So the first time we showed it outside the community was at a classroom at Rutgers University in New York. And we asked those people to fill out evaluations and tell us how they responded to it just sort of as a test. These are undergraduate students. And we had people sending us back the evaluation forms telling us that they identified as genderqueer and writing on the evaluation was the first time that they had told anybody. And we were like, okay, wow, you know, something about just putting these stories out and not trying to assert that they meant anything for anyone else was really, and has been really powerful. Was it important to tell a different story than what a Seattle-centric story would be, too? I know that that tendency, especially anything that happens in King County, tends to be Seattle-centric, and it's so different. You go across the water, so Lake Washington divides Seattle from East King County, where the documentary was shot, and it's... It's like night and day. So it was different to make a video purposefully in the east side rather than Seattle-based because, for one, there's very few queer resources in, on the east side, and so this became one of those programs that queer youth could participate in during that time, and it could be a way in which we could really use a relevant tool to train the teachers and service providers on the east side where Sid and I were working. But then there's this myth about Seattle too, right, where everyone thinks that if we cross over the bridge to Seattle, that it's liberal and, you know, one of the cities in the country that is the most progressive in terms of queer issues. And so there's an assumption that everything's kind of okay here and arrived uh, when in fact, you know, Seattle's so large and there's so many different parts of it and nowhere in Seattle are we finished with this work. And this tool is very relevant in the Seattle schools and service agencies in that area too. And a lot of the young people we work with who are Seattle based want to say, hey, you know, it's still really hard in my school, too. There's still a ton of silencing that happens, and we're still not learning about queer issues in my classrooms, and I'm still not getting the type of services that I need here in Seattle. I do think that there's a huge assumption that everything is all fine and dandy in Seattle. And the other thing that we were just talking about, too, is that we don't do a very good job of coming together. The queer youth movement, I've actually seen more diverse groups come together and rally around it, but we faction off and we get comfortable in our dark, cold, winter gray months and the community doesn't really like rally around a cause very well here contrary to popular belief Sean's only been here a year from San Francisco and you've already noticed how different it is yes it's quite different (laughs) there's certainly just not as much activism and the fractions within the community certainly are present and I feel like are an obstacle for a rallying point around either legislation or other other movements we want to agree upon 
So Sid, you spoke kind of in a roundabout way about the tour. When did the film first launch? What's kind of the timeline that you've been on? Because I know the tour is a fairly new thing, and we definitely want to talk about the tour on the podcast. Because you're sort of in the midst of that. You actually just were on tour, you're back here, and then you're going to be going out again. So we got lucky enough to get you. When we completed the film in uh, the very end of 2009, we did a huge party in East King County where we made it. And 400 people came, and it was probably the biggest queer event that's ever happened in that area, which was really fun. We had almost all the participants there, some of their families, lots of friends, lots of educators from the area, service providers, faith-based leaders. It was really, really a beautiful thing that happened. Um, And after that, we just started, we'd say beta tested the film as an education tool. And we actually made some edits. We shortened the film after that. And so we, we didn't actually get to a complete version on DVD until much into 2010. In terms of the tour, a lot of that energy came actually following a lot of the media around the gay and lesbian youth suicides. I'll put that in quotes that were present in the media at the end of 2010 and sort of the primary mainstream media's responses. So what happened here locally with our group is that there was a lot of conversation happening among the young people we work with, some of which was frustration, some of which was sadness or reconnecting with stories in their own life. And then there were these response campaigns, it gets better, a lot of things happening in the media and there was a lot of response to that as well. Uh, I'll give an example. Like I had a young person write me an email and say, hey, I saw this It Gets Better thing. Do you think I can make a video? Because it seems like it's all old people making those videos. Like, can I? Well, people aren't <laughs> <probably>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, I think so. You know, I'm certainly not the controller, but like, I think you could make one. But that really illuminated to me what um, was missing from some of the responses, which was more queer young people speaking out. And since there's been tons of videos made by queer young people, um, we wanted to make one too that would capture some of the stuff that we were hearing or just sort of throwing around in our community. Conversations we were having about what we thought the tone of a response should be and particularly around anti-bullying policy as sort of the mainstay solution to solve heterosexism, which for us is like not necessarily the primary angle of our education campaign. So we wanted to sort of challenge a little bit of that being sort of the sole response and and say, actually, we need to supplement anti-bullying with ways of bringing positive visibility into the schools instead of only policing or negatively reinforcing behaviors. And it seems like most of the anti-bullying stuff is at a state level. And so whichever states actually move forward with such legislation are the only ones where it's going to happen right now. Well, that's true. And also, I think that anti-bullying, I sort of say more in a a broader way, because this is how it's happening in schools, where maybe it's not a statewide policy, but it happens through what's been coined sort of safe space. So we'll have a lot of educators who want to sort of combat what's going on in their schools or they want to be allies and they do that through you know looking at online for resources and they find out about creating safe spaces so we'll have people ask us you know do you have safe space posters and I'm I'm starting to question back like oh well what does that mean how does that play out beyond the poster what can you do in a classroom that can really foster a space of and we try to say a liberation space a space where people can actually like bring up hard conversations and they won't be necessarily policed for saying the wrong thing, but instead invited to ask questions that are hard. Yeah, we referenced that before, just hanging up a poster that says this is a safe space or putting other on an intake form that you actually have to be prepared to have that safe space and actually hold it and not just hang a sign for it. It can actually be counter to what you're trying to do if that's not there. So I'm looking at the tour list of the places that you've been, and I'm seeing Arizona and Florida and, of course, some other small, I wouldn't even call them suburbs, just tiny towns in Washington coming up. Was there anything about anywhere where you were at that was particularly surprising? Well, I have to say, and I'm being 100% honest, everywhere that we've been on tour so far has been totally amazing and has been really, really inspiring for me as someone who's putting myself out there as an educator and an activist. Being an educator and an activist implies that I'm giving a lot to some group or community, but in fact, I feel like I'm walking away from these college campuses and these community-based organizations feeling really like I've learned 
a lot more about gender and sexuality and what that means to me and what that means in our communities. And I feel like I'm starting to learn a little bit more about this conversation on a national level. Like, what is gender and sexuality from Seattle to Jacksonville, Florida, right? And what's gender and sexuality at a small university of advanced technology in Tempe, Arizona? And what is gender and sexuality throughout Canada? And all the conversations have been really different. They range. It depends on on where we're at. So on some campuses, we're in small rooms with their what might be called a gay-straight alliance, but on some campuses, they can't even call it a gay-straight alliance because they might not get funding if they do. On some campuses, the gay-straight alliance isn't funded, so it's not even really an official club. It's just a group of students congregating. So that conversation is different than the conversation that I had, let's say, in Vancouver with undergraduate and graduate students who were really involved in this gender and sexuality topic, doing pretty extensive research on it. And so... Has it primarily been universities that have brought you out? So it's been primarily colleges, universities, and then community-based organizations. For example, in Florida, where we were last week, we had the opportunity first to go to a queer youth organization called Jasmine, Jackson Area Sexual Minority Youth Network. Following that, we went to another network of foster care agencies that's in Tampa, Florida, some of which are faith-based, that brought us out to do a training to their executive staff. And that training was kind of a test run to see how it would go, because they were kind of worried about the issue and how this conversation about gender and sexuality would go among their staff members. So we did the test run, and in fact, they really loved the training, and we had a great time with them, and uh, they learned a lot through our work. And so we've been invited to go back to a bigger conference with all of their staff and all of their foster care parents throughout this network of agencies in mid-March. So that's one of the next tour stops that we have coming up. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you guys are outreaching providers because having a master's in psych and most master's level counseling and social work programs, you get like such a tiny bit on gay and lesbian stuff and like forget gender and then through the lens of youth, not going to happen. And so even people like at a master's level that can come out and be licensed professionals can be completely clueless when some queer kid walks into their office (laughs) to get treatment or you know whatever happens to be going on it's usually a million other things besides just gender stuff so my family was from florida and i spent a year in orlando and just over the last few years in politics and what's been on the news we certainly know that arizona and florida are like some of the more conservative red states and also end up working some religion and some other things into their policies so you guys having been washington natives what was some of the most prominent differences when you go out to these campuses where there are certain questions or certain issues that was just so vastly different from, say, a blue, liberal, pretty progressive state versus there. So Kennedy mentioned one of the groups we met with in Florida at a very conservative private university, you know, couldn't use in the term gay straight alliance for their group. They use club unity, which I found kind of ironic. But I think that that's one example. And I, for a minute, I was like, oh, wow, Florida. And then actually the same day, Kennedy was on her Facebook and said, oh, actually, Seattle Pacific University just prohibited their gay straight alliance from being an official club. And they can assemble on campus, but they can't actually even rent out a room to gather it anymore following an event that the administration weren't satisfied with. So in that moment, you know, I was really kind of called out on some of my own assumptions or my own feelings about like, oh, Florida, and reminded that even in Seattle, the same things are happening. And Seattle Pacific University is a Christian school? Yeah, yeah. so that's a religious institution. But some, some of the similar themes came up in both the conversations about Seattle Pacific University and this other university in Florida, which was all related to a fear that funding would be cut if what was framed as older committed funders found out that this was going on. And that was sort of the threat, I would say, that was given to students to sort of maintain their agitation at a level in which they were willing to sort of use more covert means or willing to kind of adjust to the university's request that they don't use words like gay because they were all under the assumption that that would mean, you know, tuition increases or funding cuts that they also didn't want to be impacted by. So those sort of were used as instruments to convince students to sort of do the workarounds that the administrations were posing as solutions to this quote-unquote problem they presented on campus. So I think at this point, one of the reasons that we wanted to have both Sid and Kennedy on the episode before we actually get to talk to the amazing youth that they worked with is 
the kids are sort of the front and center of the put this on the map and reteaching gender sexuality. And so I had seen the two of you facilitate the discussion, but even when you go to the website, you're sort of hard to find and you're kind of stealth. And so I was really curious how this all came to be. And it's been really interesting hearing how you guys got here. And if you don't mind getting personal for a minute, what your own queer and gender stories. So Kennedy, if you wanted to start and tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so I'm going to start by talking about how when I became an intern at Youth Eastside Services in 2004, I was a graduate student studying relationship and family therapy, and I had an opportunity to do my internship at this youth and family-based counseling center. And on my first day of the internship, I had a voicemail message that was left to all staff seeking a therapist to co-facilitate the queer youth support group that this organization had every Thursday from six to eight. And I was really nervous at the time to put myself in a position to facilitate the support group because this was in the community that I grew up in. It was a community that my parents lived in and that all my former neighbors and friends lived in. So I was just worried about being more in the public eye as a queer person and as a queer professional working with young people. There was just a lot of fear I had around that. And I'm really glad I made the decision that day to respond and say that as a new intern, I would co-facilitate that group. And in fact, I've been facilitating it now since then. So I've been facilitating that group every Thursday from six to eight, working with these queer youth, many of whom were in Put This on the Map. And so part of my journey definitely connects my work as an individual and group therapist in that area and as an openly queer professional licensed mental health therapist in that area that's really very much connected and in a lot of these young people have been in my life then now for four or five six years first in the group and then the film put this on the map and now working together as co-educators as part of this national campaign and also doing other activism and community-based work in Seattle and so I just feel like my gender identity and my community and these young people you know we're all just working on all this together I'm hearing too, it's important to be out as a queer professional, but it's sort of like you have an added layer on top of that because you're a role model with youth. So Sid, tell us a little bit about your gender and queer history and journey. I was thinking about what Kennedy was talking about, and then I was contextualizing it in my own life because I, well, I was quite a princess growing up, not the classic trans narrative, but um, I was pretty clear about my queer identity fairly young age and was spending a lot of time online sort of exploring that and eventually got connected with activist organizations in Seattle doing HIV and AIDS outreach, sex education, youth activism, queer youth activism, queer youth support groups, including the support group that Kennedy works at now, which has been going on since the late 80s. And I was I was there during high school not in the 80s, but um, (laughs) a little bit later, (laughs) just to be clear. Anyways, I was thinking about my parents and the way that they sort of would think about or respond to the ideas about who those adults were that maybe I was connecting with. And for the most part, the tone in my household was a don't ask, don't tell, or don't talk about it. But certainly I was imagining what they would have sort of fantasized about these adults in my life were like. And I have to think about that now sometimes working with young people whose parents we don't hear from, you know, a lot. We have sort of a general understanding of where most of the young people we collaborate with are coming from. But I kind of like put myself in that role of their imagination about what I might be like or what my life might have been like. And think of my parents thinking of the adults that were role models in my life, too, and how wrong most of those ideas were that they had for sure. I think for my parents, for example, they would have thought I was certainly being encouraged to take on a, they would have explained it like a lifestyle that seemed very sad or depressing or unfortunate and that that they thought that they were, you know, certainly losing me from what they understood our culture to be or our family to be um, and that I was stepping out of my family's culture in order to be with the others that were very different from them. So I think about that now. I'm like the other. So you've been out of high school 10, almost 15 years now. And so growing up primarily as going through high school and junior high school in the 90s and the mid 90s, you're dealing with youth now that that are going through junior high school and high school now. How would you say things have changed in the last 10 years and sort of looking at your own experiences that you had as a queer youth and then looking at queer youth now? When I was in high school, I remember it was the years of, Um, maybe you remember the Ellen kiss 
and actually, <laughs> I should explain for the younger audience. So Ellen DeGeneres had a show called Ellen, a different show called Ellen. It wasn't a talk show. It like was a, a scripted sitcom show. Yeah. On the sitcom, she was going to kiss another woman, and this was a very, very, very big deal, and there was a bunch of lead-up, and so the GSA sort of group, the precursor to the GSA at my school, big event around watching this happen, and I think clearly in the last 15 years, there's been a lot more opportunity for there to be media that talked about gender and sexuality in bigger ways than a sensationalized kiss between to women. And that complicates things further because the more media it's out there, the more important it is to think about what the common thread lines are in that media and what's not being said and what's not being represented. So especially in how we're portrayed and like sensationalistic media, like you said. Yeah, it's a tension between wanting there to be more media and also wanting it to show a fuller, more robust kind of idea of what queer life is. And it's still very much I mean this is my big thing. It's still very much reinforcing and enforcing the binary and so we don't yeah. really get out of like these male female boxes well i just think that in general even on gay themed shows going from nothing to at least having a gay lifestyle of sorts be portrayed but then not really addressing gender and not representing the community as a whole and even though your audience is going to be predominantly part of that community and being very familiar with gender roles and gender variance, but to have it not reflected on TV is, I feel like, almost... It's, I feel like it's a slap of the face. Everyone but you guys. Right. The realistic face that you put up in the film is just such a relief, and the kids are just so real, and they tell their stories, and it's like, there's just so much more room to identify than what you see, like, putting up a magazine or turning on the TV. Another important thing that has shifted in this school, specifically since... 1997 when I graduated is the advent of the gay straight alliances in the safe schools and safe space movements and so those have been like I definitely want to give a nod to the space that schools have created for gay young people and allies queer people and allies to congregate and teachers who have made efforts to create classrooms that they understand as being safe and at this point that's like an area that Sid and I are very much interested in conversation with teachers and with students about, which we talked a little bit earlier in this episode, just about what does that safe space mean? How can we create a space that not only disrupts some of the bullying that's happening in the classrooms, but actually creates opportunities for queer people to see themselves reflected in curriculum and to be able to talk about their lives more openly and to have this conversation be happening more broadly than just behind the shut doors of the Gay Straight Alliance when, you know, not even a lot of queer young people often find themselves in Gay Straight Alliances, really. The testimony is that mostly Gay Straight Alliances are filled with folks who are allies, which is amazing and awesome, but not necessarily a space that queer people are finding a lot of community in. That phenomenon of identifying which one of these is not like the others, it's like, oh, I actually fit in here. And these other people feel the same way I do about a lot of things. And the way that education around these issues has changed in the last 10 to 12 years here locally, because I did education work as a high school student on these issues too, and I was part of what traditionally we've used as panelist program, where you get up and you tell your personal testimony and people ask you questions. And I think what we're seeing now, which is exciting, is moving away from sort of simply violence prevention models where we're trying to keep people you know safe from being bullied or even verbally harassed and what we're doing is we're like really grappling with underlying issues of heterosexism and oppression in the way in which we reaffirm all the time a sense of being normal and a sense of being othered and I think that's what's really exciting right now in terms of the education movement and how it's changed. You kind of answered how far it's come and where we're at now. Where do you see it going in the next five to ten years? And looks like you're taking sort of a local effort and you're moving into more national space now with it. How do you see the project that you're working on up against sort of the queer youth movement in general, I guess, on a state or national level? I'll just start by saying I feel really inspired by some of the work that's happening nationally. But instead of trying to cover that, I'll just say what's happening locally with us, which is also really inspiring. And that's that a group of young queer people here in Seattle have started a new movement. And it really came out of them wanting to assess the needs of their own peers and community 
and then take steps to try to meet that need. And so what happened here is that there was a large event to assess that need. It was run by queer youth. And Kennedy and I have been really honored to be a part of supporting that movement. It started as a campaign called We Need Queer Youth Space. And without a mission, it sort of provoked the questions about what it meant to be queer, what it meant to be youth, and what it meant to have space. And all those questions are really provocative and actually led to a bigger community dialogue that there was a lot of interest in having on those topics. And so that might sound a little abstract or vague, but specifically I've seen like queer come to mean more than who we sleep with or what our gender identity is, but more about a maybe a politic that's about countering sort of the insidious heterosexism that we all like operate in and see and and as somebody who wants to work against that or wants to resist that or is agitated by that we can then claim the word queer if we want to and there's no other check marks that you have to check to get that identity so that's kind of a beautiful way that the community here has sort of changed and adapted what queer means and I think that's really important to where the queer youth movement is is headed. I think this conversation ties very much into the four themes that we're bringing with us on tour, which I just want to introduce by name, but not go into too much. If you're interested in having the conversation, if these themes inspire you, then you can certainly contact us to be in more conversation about what I'm about to lay out. So the four themes that we're bringing with us on tour are uh, tensions that we hold, one being this one that we're talking about right now, LGBT. So our first theme is called Rethinking LGBT, and it's the tension around those identifiers and what that means in relationship to gender and the binary. Understanding that LGBT are certainly valid and important identifiers, but also the connection of those identifiers with gender and queerness. Um, The second theme is Rethinking Safe Space, which is one that we've been talking about throughout this episode, too. So Safe Space being a really important movement that's happened in our schools and in our communities, but rethinking it because how do we move from having a safe space that uses a lot of these disciplinary or punishment tactics to a liberation space where we can have more brave conversations within our schools and communities. The third theme is rethinking coming out, coming out being one of those narratives that we understand as being kind of the most important story that a queer youth can tell us. When did you come out and how was it? And when did you come out to your parents and what happened? So that story being important, but the tension being that coming out story is much bigger than that. Come out a lot more than just one time and kind of the question and the tension around why we come out or why we have to come out in that relationship to the heteronormative communities that we live in too. And the fourth theme is rethinking allyship that theme takes on a lot of meanings, one being allyship towards young people, so what it means to have a movement that has queer youth voice at the forefront, and then also what it means to be an ally in the queer community, and what it means for the queer community to be in solidarity with other communities, and how we're all in this movement together across the board. So those are some of the themes that we're thinking about lately. I would just say that then there's some overarching values that wrap into each of those themes, one of which is Something that's like used a lot, so I don't want to use it in this overused way, but the intersections of identities and talking about in which ways race and class and ability have positioned us in our queer experience and how we can't draw, you know, when we're talking about rethinking these things that we're inviting people to bring all those things into the conversation. So coming out to different communities looks differently. Coming out as a person with a disability looks differently. All those things are a part of what a safe space means and all those things require us to rethink allyship. So those are sort of the cross section of values that we're employing and all those themes as we're looking at rethinking things. So kind of in the context of where the queer youth movement is going in the next five or 10 years, where do you see sort of the next wave of policy and legislation? I guess you could speak to the anti-bullying stuff too, but You know, specifically through your lens, you know, where would you see wanting that to go? And at a local level, at a national level, whatever you want to speak to. I guess I would say sexual orientation and gender identity are important classes to include in sort of anti-discrimination policies. I think that's going to become more complicated in the courts to determine that as fluidity of gender and sexuality becomes more complicated. So I'm kind of curious about how that will play out eventually in in my lifetime. I think what we touched on earlier is sort of practice. Policies are 
a part of the process and practice and implementation is actually much more what we focus on. So having an anti bullying policy relies on that being implemented. And one thing our group is concerned about and wants to study and follow is ensuring that anti-bullying policies don't just perpetuate some of the problems that we have in the schools around discipline overall. And what I'm referring to is the way in which school discipline policies oftentimes sort of compound other factors which lead to race and class disparities and also disparities for queer youth and queer youth of color and queer youth from low-income communities or immigrant communities in which those youth are sort of tracked through discipline into the juvenile justice system or out of school. I'm interested to see and also like respond in a way in which practice can really not continue or perpetuate problems we have with school inequities or also in social services, barriers to service or accesses to service through the further policing of those environments. Well, changing law is one thing, and actually changing culture and society is a whole other thing. And then the other thing I want to say about policy and practice, which is something I'm sort of obsessed with in terms of policies that affect young people, is really figuring out ways that we can have young people be a part of helping us articulate those policies and those practices because they're uh, way more adept at figuring out what it is that they need for themselves. And I think as adults, we like to think that we probably know better because of how many years we've lived or how many books we've read or the experiences we've had. But in actuality, I find most of my best practice advice has come directly from young people themselves who are giving me feedback about what they need. So I'd like to see, you know, the next steps in policy really be informed by young people's voices. Having them at the table. For those of you listening that haven't been to the website or have heard about Put This on the Map or the Reteaching Gender and Sexuality campaign, how do folks find out more? So you can find out more by visiting our website, which is putthisonthemap.org. And you can email us at any time at info at putthisonthemap.org or join us on Facebook or Twitter. So as far as what's coming up next for you two, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing in the next couple months. So in March, we launch the official spring tour, and I'm just going to name some of the places that we're going in case you're listening from those communities and you want to book a tour stop in that area, your college campus or in your community-based organization. Some of the places that we're heading include Ontario, Canada, the New England states in New York, Baltimore area, North Carolina. We're headed to Florida, Nashville, Atlanta, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, And we're also headed to California, Oregon, and then back up to Washington. So our tour will range from March till mid-May. And then we're looking forward to booking a fall tour as well and already have some dates on the calendar set. So if you're interested, please contact us at info at putthisonthemap.org. Thank you so much, Sid and Kennedy, for joining us. It was great to have you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. So welcome to Episode 5 Check-Ins. And before we started with our check-in routine, we wanted to just take a minute and reflect kind of on our personal experiences doing the interview with Sid and Kennedy and, and what we thought and some interesting things that we learned while doing this podcast. Just being caught up in asking the questions and sitting here with them, I've now had a chance to kind of think back and I'm just really impressed. The movie itself is very impressive. I really like the discussion of the intersection of race, class, and ability with all of the gender and sexuality stuff that we were talking about and how important that is. And the other piece that I really liked was talking about queer youth space and what it means to be queer, what it means to be a youth, and what it means to have space. I feel like this idea of safe space and this idea of space was very suffused throughout the conversation that we had with them and something that they take very seriously and think about a lot. And just to also comment about that, I think the things that I have since reflected on that I wasn't reflecting on prior to this interview was the idea around safe space versus liberated space and the history behind safe space and it kind of always being an area that is, well, an acknowledgement of violence against the community and really reflects around the policing of behavior versus creating a space that looks at why the violence is there in the first place and the opinions and emotional issues that are there that create the violence and getting those out in in a safe dialogue And then the other thing that I thought was really interesting was the coming out story. I mean, I guess I haven't now, you know, as I've just done my second coming out of sorts, 
with my friends and family. And it, it was stressful, but certainly not as stressful as, as telling my, my parents and family at the time when I was much younger that I was gay. But the idea of, of just rethinking, like, why do we have to come out in the first place? And especially around our gender, like coming out as gay or lesbian, that's kind of like this rite of passage, really, as a youth or someone that is exploring their sexuality. But then coming out again just around your gender and having to explain that. And it's such a fluid thing, and it's such a thing that requires so much inner dialogue and revelation within yourself. It's interesting to to try to verbalize that and explain it to someone when you're still learning about it. So I thought that was really reflective, and it's something I've been thinking about, too. And Kennedy talked about the four domains and the the coming out story, um, rethinking coming out, and I don't plan on taking hormones or having surgeries and being genderqueer. It's something where I'm constantly having to come out, and it's something I'm thinking about a lot just around my professional environment and you know, nobody really knows. They just make assumptions and nobody really knows until I'm up front and educate. And for me, I think in rethinking coming out, there's just such a huge education component because just telling somebody I'm genderqueer is never enough. People have questions and they want more explanation and it's always a conversation. The other thing I was thinking about how our community is in Seattle and I know that we talked about building up our community and tearing down in episode four. And I was just thinking about the Ref 71 campaign. And I think that that was a cause that the queer community in Seattle was really able to join and rally around and a place where, you know, if there was divisiveness, I think it was very much not as loud as the coming togetherness. And I just think that that is worth mentioning. And Washington is the only state in the entire country where we've been able to pull off what we pulled off with our Ref 71 campaign, which was keep the domestic partnership laws that we had already passed, keep them valid. I was thinking about that after we had recorded the interview with Sid and Kennedy and just wanted to mention that. I guess I'm just going to add really quick too, and working off of Jesse's coming out and gender queer. And this has been on my mind lately. And I recently actually just watched the YouTube about someone speaking about basically wanting to be visibly trans and confront and educate around the binary, but at the same time, for safety reasons and other issues, just really trying to have an awareness of being visible, but having to draw real lines about, well, when I pass as a male, when is my responsibility to come out? Is it, hi, my name is Sean, I'm trans. I think that's especially for guys that will be taking hormones or are passing or are stealth, even if you want to continue to be an activist and be visible in the trans community and own that identity, how it works in your daily life at work or with strangers or how that works. I think visibility in the trans community versus visibility out in society at large is another fence that people sort of sit on and and have to navigate. The other update that we had in follow-up to the interview with Sid and Kennedy was we had spoke a little bit, Sid had mentioned the Unity Group and what had been going on at Seattle Pacific University, which is a Christian university here in Seattle. And since we had the interview with them, there was some follow-up to that particular situation. So with this particular issue, I've just done a little bit of follow-up on it. Just to give a little background, basically what was happening was that the students were not allowed to meet on campus, or at least not meet under like school umbrella sponsorship, and have a GSA of sorts and talk about sexuality and these types of topics and have it be sponsored by the school. And so the article that was published in the school newspaper for SPU basically had most of the staff, it looked like, kind of rallying around this point and saying, we want this to be an exploration of your faith and we want to support that dialogue. It's something that's touchy within the church right now. It's something that has historically had a lot of opinions in it and oftentimes were conflicting, but they basically said, yes, we want to sponsor that. We want to encourage open dialogue about all of these issues. So they did go ahead and allow them to convene on campus, and it looks like they're making headway with that. So it was an open letter to the students. So in regards to other updates, we want to just talk a little bit about current events and, of course, want to talk again. This episode is airing on March 14th, so you still will have a week before the men concert, which is on Monday, March 21st. We spoke in the last podcast about a band called Lovers, who is going to be opening for men. And in addition to Lovers, there'll be another opener called Secret Shoppers. So you get to see all three bands for eight bucks at the Crocodile, and the show starts at eight o'clock. And I just want to say, since we found out that Lovers was opening for them, we've done a little internet YouTube 
searching around and oh my god the kexp live version of boxers is amazing and they are hot they are hot they are hot i thought you might like them <laughs> so i'm glad i youtube for that for you jesse has since bought the cd and is now quite a fan so so one of the other things that is coming up as far as activism will be on the 22nd so the day after men really it's the quality day march it's going to be in olympia on their state capitol and it We'll be covering a lot of things. I think it's really organized by Equal Rights Washington. It'll convene from 8 to 6 p.m. And I know that they're going to be looking at lobbying and talking to legislators about education and HIV awareness and also obviously moving towards the equality of marriage. So these are some good things. Definitely get involved and check that out. So that's the current events coming up. And then in addition to the stuff that's happening in March, something Sean and I were throwing around, and I guess we want to hear from our Seattle listeners, is doing some sort of trans and trans ally meetup for, you know, anybody in the that identifies as trans in the local area. And people are interested in that or think that that would be a good idea or already doing something like that. We would love to hear from you. And that's about as far as we've gotten on it is just thinking about it. One of the reasons I really wanted to do this podcast is to basically build community and try to get people rallied here in the Northwest. And I know that about half of our downloads are coming from Seattle slash Tacoma listeners. So we really would like to meet you guys. Yeah, and I think it would be more of a social group. In fact, I would probably want to play Scrabble. So so we wanted to just do one quick bathroom buzz. We had Jamie from Arizona, I believe, email us in, and they talked to us about being confronted by a child in the bathroom, and the child asked them if they were a boy or a girl. We weren't going to go a whole lot into their answer. It's on the Facebook page. But we just wanted to put out to you as listeners, I know that I've had somebody, a little girl actually chased me into the bathroom before and thought I was a guy going into the women's bathroom. So we're just wondering if other folks have had this experience and what their response was to the child in the bathroom with them. And is, you know, is that a time where it really is important to kind of think about how we want to educate young people who may or may not be with their parents around gender stuff and and how do we have that conversation like where do you even start yeah especially when you're in this kind of ambush very quick interaction it's not like you can sit them down for 10 minutes and talk about the history of the binary and how gender is fluid and you know depending on their age it probably will go right over their head so for our last check-in, we're going to do Rachel Maddow debunction junction. In terms of Sean and I have been reading The Transgender Child, A Handbook for Families and Professionals by Stephanie Brill and Rachel Pepper. I'll post a link to that on the podcast airing on the Lipson site. You know, we're always reading some kind of book and we're not going to go into a big discussion of this book, maybe at a future time, but we wanted to talk about some myths around transgender youth and children. And so we pulled our debunction junction questions from this book. So the first statement is every gender variant child is transgender. And that would be a big false. This book talks about this on a couple of occasions. And for me, it brings up a lot of social and cultural kind of norms and pressures. But in general, it talks about the difference between like a gender nonconforming child and transgender and how some children will never become transgendered. But in general, it talks about how a lot of this is not around the child. It's not the child's need. It's the parent's need to kind of be able to explain to others what their child is and why they are nonconforming. And so it's the parents really wanting to be able to box in their child and say, oh, well, it's because they're trans. It really talks about the dangers around pushing your child into that box and labeling them as transgender when they just may be exploring their gender at a young age, and that's it. The second statement is, we don't know what makes people transgender. True. No one yet knows what makes some people transgender. Transgender people have been documented throughout history, throughout cultures. Some live open lives, others keep their transgender identity to themselves and do not feel safe externally expressing their true self, and still others hide their identities completely and are not discovered until after death. Being transgender is a normal variance of human expression. And that comes from, I just read that actually right from the book on page 14. So the next statement is, Some children or teens may mistakenly think they are transgender. True. The book talks about this 
there's kids that actually may think that they are transgender, but don't actually wind up being transgender later in life. And so this is what the book has to say. And I thought that this was really poignant. Some children have been raised with so much homophobia and such strict gender training that instead of acknowledging their romantic attraction for the same sex, they assume they must really be transgender. They feel that there is no way they could ever be gay. It isn't possible. It wouldn't be right. However, if they were actually transgender, it might all make sense. Instead of being gay and experiencing same-sex attraction, their attraction would be for the, quote, opposite sex. As outlandish as this rationalization may seem, it can form in the mind of a child who wants to continue being loved and accepted by their family and community. So I think, again, and, you know, at a time when kids are developing, the, the concept of the binary is just so enforced and so out there, and most people don't have a script for anything else but the binary and this in the mind of a child, this is what they're negotiating. And even saying things like little girl toys or girl clothing, I think is just does us such a disservice because clothing is clothing. And I think a little assigned male sex at birth person that wants to wear dresses, it doesn't necessarily have to be gendered, but because of the way our world is set up, it definitely is. This just makes me think about too, the more we can get away from gendering body parts and gendering ways of dressing thinking back to dean spade's recent post about the purportedly gendered body parts i just in my mind and in sort of my daily life i'm just trying to think about this differently and think about vaginas as vaginas and not necessarily female and think about breasts as breasts and not necessarily female body parts they're just body parts and I just really appreciate that because I think it's helping me think about it differently. But unfortunately, the world that's out there doesn't necessarily think about it differently. And this is the world that our kids are growing up in. And this is what they have to negotiate. So thanks again for tuning in to episode five. Thanks to Sid and Kennedy for agreeing to sit down with us and discuss their projects of Put This on the Map and Reteaching Gender and Sexuality. Look forward to episode six, where we're going to be interviewing some of the youth from Put This on the Map. And that will air right after this one. And we'll be posting several links to Sid and Kennedy's endeavors as well as some of the things we've mentioned here. I was a dirt beneath whose wheel. Fox.